Isabel held her breath. An actor, dressed all in black, stood alone on the stage in shimmering gaslight. The restless, noisy audience grew hushed in the charisma of his presence, and the actor spoke. Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would melt, thaw and resolve itself into a dew. He continued, building up Hamlet's passionate conflict and holding the audience in wide-eyed awe. Isabel, oblivious to the stench of rotten fruit, lamp oil and orange peel that had first offended her nose when she came into the little barn-like theatre on her uncle's arm, leaned forward on the wooden bench. Her eyes shone and her hand gripped the handle of her fan, now still, despite the muggy heat of the August night. Her shawl slipped from her shoulders without her noticing. Never had she seen or heard anything that touched her so deeply in her very soul, not even the Sunday preacher, whose dramatic proclamations and gestures seemed false, cold and hollow in comparison. Fie on it! Ah, fie! Tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Here was a man who spoke of real emotion, real feeling. Surely, she thought, this player knows real anguish to be able to interpret those words with such power and meaning. Her heart went out to him. Frailty, thy name is woman. Tears filled Isabel's eyes as Hamlet spoke of his mother's betrayal of his dead father and his own wounded feelings. It is not, nor it cannot come to good, but break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. The soliloquy ended, the other actors entered the stage, and Isabel sat back on the bench, slowly pulling her shawl around her shoulders once more, and cooling her flushed face with her fan. Henry Hartley, unbuttoning his Horatio costume as he came off the stage after the curtain call, eyed Frank Douglas, the company's new young leading actor, and thoughtfully nodded his head. Mm. He's good, he thought. Very good. A good actor and a very good voice too. But his character off the stage is a little wanting in modesty for my liking. There is nothing that spoils an actor so much as conceit in his own abilities. Yet, damn the boy, he has that arrogant boyish charm that one cannot help liking and sets women constantly at his feet. Now look here. Indeed, is my own wife singing his praises and I had better go and rescue her at once. My dear Mrs Hartley, Frank was saying as Henry came within earshot, your delightful praise would not be quite so appropriate were it not for the fact that one has such excellent fellow players such as your good self. Why, Hartley, my good fellow, I was just saying to your charming wife here how her portrayal of Gertrude is such strong support to a green actor such as myself. Do you not think so, my friend? Indeed, sir, though it would be pertinent to add that the part of Ophelia would be more suited to her years, replied Henry with a wink at his, at his wife. It takes great acting ability to play the mother to someone of your uh, maturity. Caroline laughed in her good-natured way. Oh, Henry, she said, taking his arm and patting his hand. Come now, Mr. Douglas was being quite delightful and sweet, and I am sure I hardly deserve it. Eliza is far more suited to Ophelia. And anyway, the play belongs to him after all. And you know that his Hamlet has been compared to the great Kemble himself in the recent reviews. Frank gave a little mock humble bow and Henry raised one eyebrow. Compared? <laughs> yes, indeed, that may be so, my love, but you know there are good comparisons and then there are the other kind. This was said with a grin and a twinkle in his eye. Oh, now don't listen to him, Mr Douglas. I know full well that he admires your work just as much as I do. Why, only the other day I looked over his shoulder when he was writing to his brother and read his description of our new quite brilliant leading player and that he felt no doubt that he would become one of the leading stars of London sooner or later. Is that not so, Henry? Go on, you have to admit it. Of course, my dear, there is absolutely nothing in that letter I would wish to withdraw. 
replied Henry, thinking of some other remarks about Frank in the same letter, such as conceited and arrogant, that Caroline had tactfully left out. Quite so. Now, Thomas has sent a note asking us to dine with him with George and Francis after the show, so hurry and get changed. Caroline playfully poked him in the stomach and ran off towards the cramped changing rooms behind the stage. She looked forward to dining with Thomas Gary, who was the theatre company's solicitor and had become a close friend of her husband's. Henry fondly watched her go and made towards his own dressing area. A strong arm across his shoulders waylaid him. I say, Hartley, a jolly good move of yours, marrying the manager's daughter, and a very fine woman too, if I may say so. Henry stiffened, irritated by the man's insulting implications. A love match, I assure you, sir. Now, if you will excuse me, I have an appointment. Uh, just one moment, my friend. I wanted to ask you something as a man of the world. Henry's left eyebrow lifted for a moment, and he turned questioningly to his colleague, forcing the other to take his arm away from his shoulders. Frank Douglas lowered his voice. This town of Daventry, you're obviously well in with the company's solicitor, Thomas Gerry. You must know something of the town. I wondered, being myself a stranger here, you know how difficult it is to meet the right people in our line of business. But whether you might know some young people you could introduce me to, particularly those of the feminine persuasion, if you understand me. A discreet arrangement, of course. Mr Douglas, Henry interrupted in a harsh whisper, am I to take it that you are asking me to procure meetings with women? Frank chuckled a little. Oh, come now, Hartley, as your wife so sweetly said, don't be so stuffy. After all, our profession is not a naive one. Rogues and vagabonds, don't they call us? Are we not all tarred by the same brush? Surely you must know of some suitable young ladies within the town? Young ladies? Yes, I know a few, said Henry, staring him candidly in the eye. But suitable for your requirements? I do not think so. And with that, he turned and stiffly walked on his way through the creaking doors at the side of the stage to the little back room where he found George Partleton brushing off his hat. The rest of the cast had already gone. Good night, good house tonight, Hartley, said George, a younger actor who was married to another of Jackman's daughters, Frances. Let's hope the weather holds for the rest of the week. Henry sat down and started to unlace his boots. He was still bristling from his conversation with Douglas and muttered, Yes, let us hope so. Well, I will see you at Gary's then, said George, and left Henry on his own. What an impudent young man that Douglas was. Yet, as he pulled off the cramping stage boots and stretched his stockinged feet, curling his toes with relief, he could not help remembering that only a few years ago he himself was not dissimilar. A young actor, full of arrogance and self-importance, revelling in his own ability to impress and influence young women, purely because of the attractive glamour and disreputable nature of his profession. A rogue and vagabond? Well, it was still possible for actors to be flung into jail on such a charge for playing without a licence. Henry frowned and sucked his teeth. In the eyes of some, he was no more than a strolling player, a vagrant of no fixed abode. That had not mattered to him when he was a young man of twenty. In fact, he had rather enjoyed the feeling of rebellion, the sense of being different to the people he had grown up with and the freedom it gave him from the rather restricted life he had previously led as the son of a respectable schoolmaster in Oxfordshire. He still enjoyed the life. It was exciting and gave variety to one's day-to-day -day existence. But to a man approaching 30, playing the supporting role or the clown, or singing a comic song in what was usually no more than a fitted-up barn, many of them cold and draughty, Walking miles from one theatre to another, from week to week, playing to pits full of noisy and often not too fresh agricultural labourers. Well, it was becoming a little tedious. 
Oh, to find a place in a London theatre. So many times now he had thought of it. Proper, purpose-built theatres. Warm because of their terraced positioning with other buildings. No need to travel cross-country. And a far, far better quality of audience. And real, brilliant actors to work with. He had tried so long now to find a manager to take him on. But there was always some excuse. They were taking on no new players. They had no funds. No need for a comic actor. One day, he thought, one day, I must break into London. That's the place to be. Or else, or else. Well, there would be no other alternative. So he knew he could not play the circuits for very much longer. And sooner or later, he would have to make a decision. As his wife came to meet him, he had one other thought. If Frank was going to find a young lady to amuse himself with, at least it would divert his attentions away from Caroline's younger sister, Sophia, who Henry was sure had become rather infatuated with the new star actor. Isabel stood in front of her mirror, holding the candle next to her face and watching how her eyes sparkled in the reflection. Slowly, noting every movement on her face, she widened her eyes, her lips parting, and her eyebrows lifting in an expression of fear and horror. She spoke in a whisper. Oh, what a noble mind is here, O throne! She clasped her throat. Oh, woe is me to have seen what I have seen! The door opened, and her sister Cassandra came in, dressed in her nightgown and also holding a candle. Is he? Not undressed yet. Mamma will... Oh, Cassie, Cassie, interrupted Isabel, grasping her younger sister by the arm and pulling her to sit next to her on the bed. I have had such an evening. How I wish you'd come. I've been dying to tell you. The theatre is wonderful. You can't imagine. There are lights and, and moving boards that change the scene. So one minute you're in a royal palace and the next minute outside in a graveyard. And there was a ghost who came up through the hole in the stage and, and a duel at the end. And oh, Cassie, Hamlet himself, all in black and such passion. Izzy, you mustn't let Mama hear you talk like that. You know she didn't want Uncle George to take you at all. If she hears you say such things, why, she'll think you've gone quite mad. Oh, yes, sighed Isabel, lying back on the bed with the candle holder perched on her stomach. Perhaps I am mad, just like poor Ophelia. You mustn't say such things, whispered Cassandra, who had a horror of lunatic asylums ever since she had been taken to visit one as a special treat by another uncle. Oh, Cass, I can't bear it. Tomorrow we'll continue just as normal and go on forever and ever, dull and boring, with nothing to do but help father make shoes. And even after marriage, it would be just the same, except with the extra drudgery of raising a family and endless penny pinching and sewing and sewing and sewing. Oh, Isabel, I wish you wouldn't talk like this. Why, anyone would think that you didn't want a husband and a family. Isabel did not answer, but shut her eyes, thinking once more of the athletic young man in black and the way he fought in the duel scene at the end. His untimely death. Farewell, sweet prince. The door banged open and Isabel jumped. Cassie gave a little scream as the candle was nearly upset onto the bedclothes, but just managed to catch it in time though tallow dripped onto the embroidered spread. Isabel Bright, said her stepmother, standing framed in the doorway, her face illuminated from below by yellow flickering flame. What do you think you are doing with that candle? You would have us all burnt to the ground one day, I am sure of it. There's the very devil in you, girl, no doubt about it. You'll end up in the workhouse, that's a fact. They must have known Isabel Bright lived here when they built that one on the London Road. It's there waiting for you. Just look at that bedspread and you still in your best gown. Cassie, go down into the shop and see if you can find some turpentine. Yes, Mama, said Cassie, scuttling away. 
Just what are you thinking of? Not in bed yet and playing with candles. Mama, I wasn't. 19 years old last month and still behaving like an infant. This is what comes of letting your father's brother take you to that dreadful place. Theatre, indeed. I know I never should have allowed it. Oh, you'll be the death of me and no mistake. Nothing but a den of sin and corruption. If Mrs Chapman knew I had allowed you inside that building with all those vagabonds. But, Mama, it makes my heart sick to think how she would look down her nose at me. Well, never again, that's for sure. Your father persuaded me once. He's soft on you, and I'm softer still for listening to him. All that nonsense about education for girls. It won't happen again. You can be sure of that. Do you hear me, Isabel? Isabel's cheeks were burning red. Yes, Mama. And take off that dress before you spoil it. And when you've cleaned the spread, you'll have to hang it up by the window to dry. Yes, Mama. Mrs Bright turned at the door, pausing before she left. No doubt you can't help the way you are. I suppose you get your character from your mother. Thank God she died before she could have had such an influence on Cassandra. I pray for you every night, but it may do no good. I've done my best, and that's a fact. But the sooner someone takes you off my hands, the better. Though I seriously doubt whether any decent young man would take you. If you don't pull yourself together, you'll end up in the workhouse, and that's the truth. The workhouse, Isabel. Shaking her head, she left the room. Isabel stood for a while, digging her nails into the palms of her hand. She did not care what her stepmother said about her. But when she insulted her own dear, beautiful, red-haired mother, she found it almost too much to bear. She thought of how her mother's soft voice, its lilting Irish accent, and the way she used to sing her to sleep when she was a child. She could still remember the haunting melody of that old Irish lullaby, and she sometimes hummed it to herself when she couldn't sleep. Her mother had died of consumption when Isabel was six, and Cassandra but four years old, and her father had very quickly found another wife to take care of his two children. Isabel held back hot tears, and when Cassie returned with the turpentine and cloth, she had begun to undress, slowly unlacing the front of her bodice. What did Mama say? asked Cassie, her eyes wide as she scrubbed at the bedspread. Isabel wrinkled her nose at the pungent smell of turpentine. Oh, the usual sort of thing, she said nonchalantly. Threatened me with the workhouse, as she has done since it was built last year. Cassie shuddered. Oh, Izzy. Isabel's dress fell to the floor and she stepped out of it, then leaned on the bed pillar while Cassie unlaced her corset. Cassie, she said, her head against the plain wood. Do you think I'm pretty? Oh, Izzy, how can you ask such a thing? Of course you are. Why, haven't I always envied you, your green eyes and white skin and fine cheekbones? And your hair is so thick. I've never been able to keep my hair in ringlets for more than two hours before they drop out. But look, yours is just as curled and bouncing as when they came out in rags. Came out of the rags. And the colour, you have that beautiful auburn colour that lights up the sun, lights up in the sun. Why, mine is just brown. Would you like me to brush it for you, Izzy? Isabel smiled and watched in the mirror as Cassie brushed out her hair. What a shame it was to have her lovely thick hair that lights up in the sun, as Cassie had said, permanently tied up and hidden from view underneath a poke bonnet. Her eyes and hair were certainly her best features, and she knew she had a sweet smile. She must be a constant reminder to the second Mrs Bright of her beautiful predecessor. No wonder she was so jealous. Isabel smiled. A pity, though, that her father, so devastated at his wife's untimely death, had been so in need of a wife and had married a young woman from a strict Methodist family, producing four more children. Isabel stared at herself, fascinated. Her stepmother was wrong. She would have no difficulty finding a man, and the sooner the better. If she had to lead a life of drudgery, then better one where she would be mistress in her own home, rather than one where she was constantly treated like a naughty child. 
I'll show them all, she thought, as she snuffed out the candle after she and Cassie were both in bed. Then I can go to the theatre whenever I want, and I don't care how shocked they are. I'll do as I please when I'm married. She slept and dreamed that Hamlet was escorting to her to a ball, speaking to her in beautiful sounding language that she could not quite understand. And when he offered her a glass of rum punch, it smelt distinctly of turpentine. <laughs>